Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Antonio Pascol uh, from University of Lisbon. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm going to give you a, a glimpse of the work that we have been doing over the past 25 years, a little bit. Um, and, and I want to touch upon two things, not only the technology, but the soul behind it. Now, I'm not going to fill the slides with formulas and stuff, but it's always important for the younger students to have an idea of the soul that is behind this, the algorithms and things like that. So Portugal is not very well known uh, in the world, I guess. So this is a brief description of my university uh, in Lisbon. And uh, I would like to add that we have joined doctoral programs with MIT, CMU, and uh, EFL, EPFL. Uh, and, and, and we are in the business of trying to afford marine scientists tools to uh, advance the ways we uh, study uh, the ocean. And, and also, uh, we are forced in the good sense of establishing synergies with research institutes and the industry. So what I'm going to talk about is truly the work of many over the years with the excellent groups in Europe and over the world. Uh, and I would like to stress here the collaboration that we have had for more than 20 years now with India. So we have, of course, some of the vehicles available. We manufacture most of them. We have autonomous surface vehicles and underwater vehicles, all kinds and shapes. You have them there. We also have some infrastructures available for testing. Uh, you remember this, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, so what are the scientific challenges that we are trying to address in cooperation with the marine scientists? To study the physical, chemical, biological, and geological phenomena that occur not only in the water column, but mainly at the interface with the atmosphere and, and the bottom. So as you know, uh, breaking the surface, and here I borrow the expression of a good friend of mine, Nikola Miskovic from Croatia, that he runs an event called Breaking the Surface to you know, convey this image. We have to break that ocean and make it available for everyone. And we all know because why is it that it is so difficult to operate that for a number of reasons that I'm not going to, to mention now. Uh, and I would like to mention to why is it that I got interested in marine robotics, uh, especially in multiple vehicles. And this started around 1998, uh, when scientists in the, in the Azores asked me if we could get into a program whereby we would have an AUV performing some functions and allowing the marine scientists to have access to some of the data, not in real time, of course. So as you know, uh, when we try to communicate from underwater to the surface, okay, so we use acoustic devices and then we get into a problem because we have all the multi-path effects. Uh, and so underwater communications are very hard because then you have to embed and put some intelligence into the systems that process the data. However, if you transmit in the vertical, you eliminate the multi-path aspects and the bandwidth can shoot up. Uh, and this, this was behind this very first project in 2000, where I, for the first time, uh, played with cooperation among vehicles. In other words, I have a surface vehicle, an underwater vehicle, and both of them collaborating, the top one riding the bottom one. Uh, this is year seven done. We didn't quite accomplish this because at the time the sensors were huge, ultra-short baseline systems, communication systems, so on and so forth. Um, we did manage to do some of it, but we were not completely happy and satisfied. Uh, so, of course, a new era was born, I would, I would say, around 2009. And that's when we had access to miniaturized computers, embedded systems, sensors, actuators, my God. And I like to show this uh, picture here. I'm not trying to sell this because my friend Banash will, will do that. This is a beautiful sensor that is being manufactured by Evologix. It has the combination of a ranging device, it's a modem and an ultra short baseline. So this allows you one vehicle to find out where the neighbors are to communicate 
I, I mean, things like this have completely changed our field. Now we can relax and find out how uh, one vehicle is going to perceive or sense where the others are, and we can get truly into cooperative stuff. So highlights. The first one has to do with what I would call geotechnical survey. So there's a, a figure here that you probably have seen before. I don't know how to, oh, maybe it's here. Is it the top button? No. Uh, I'm here. So if you want to study what is at the bottom of the ocean and underneath, and, and you can go down hundreds or even kilometers, hundreds of meters are kilometers. So this is the classical approach for geophysical surveying to detect resources underwater and beneath the, the seafloor. So you have a ship that has what we call a boomer or a spire sparker, high power, boom, it sonifies the water column, penetrate, refract, so on and so forth. And then this guy is towing an array that can be very large with hydrophones. These are called the streamers. And sometimes they are more than five kilometers long. Okay, that's the classical approach. Now we wanted to do something different. We wanted to do geotechnical surveys in reduced areas. Uh, most, okay, you can still use this to find out if there are resources out there, but mostly to study the foundations when you want to establish some infrastructures there. So this is the classical approach. It's extremely expensive. Uh, and we came up with a project called We Must, whereby we replaced the, the surface ship by two autonomous robots equipped with these things called the sparkers that generate the sound. And instead of having just these uh, streamers that are being towed, and therefore the flexibility of the thing is very poor, why not have a bunch of vehicles that are underwater and they tow um, several, you know, all of them, several small streamers, and now they can work as an antenna and they can actually shape the antenna, the geometry, and it can get closer to the sea bottom, therefore increasing the resolution of the thing. Again, this is better said than done because now you have a huge problem because if you have to coordinate, in our case, we had seven vehicles in the water, so two at the surface, another one that played the role of an anchor also at the surface and four vehicles underwater with the streamers. Now you can imagine what goes into the making of this, even though it's very exciting, it's quite stressful because we had vehicles from different partners uh, so now you have to develop the navigation, guidance and control, communication, so on and so forth, but it was fun. So this is our vehicle. There's a, a, the dual of this, which is Italian. That's our vehicle back in Lisbon. Here you see the sparkers. So essentially you have a bunch of electrodes and you boom, about 5.2 kilowatt. And so the water evaporates. And then when it collapses down, it generates the sound. And that's what you have here. So that's one of the one of the vehicles. This is one of the first pictures where we actually had two uh, vehicles at the surface with the, with the sparkers, an anchor vehicle that would know exactly what it was, and then four vehicles, two from Portugal and two from Italy, and, and trying to do this um, interesting thing. So what's the theory behind? Now, in order to tackle these problems, and this is more towards the young researchers that want to find topics of research. I'm not talking about the technology now. Now, in order to make this work together, you really need to get into network, motion planning, navigation, and control. And nonlinear control and estimation, range-based localization, because you want to make these vehicles relatively cheap, optimization, even driven systems, because when you are underwater, and you are doing cooperation, you cannot expect to inundate or flood the channel. You have to be very parsimonious about communication. You have to find out when vehicle I should communicate with vehicle B. And that's what we use all the time, even driven network systems. And then communications, multimodal communications, optical and acoustics. Uh, okay. So in order to do this, uh, we have to develop all these blocks where everything is cooperative. So there's a mission specification and then you do some motion planning. 
can use the Pronto of John Hauser. We have done that in the past. Now you have the plan. Uh, you know where you are through navigation based on the plan and knowing where you are, then you control the vehicles to sort of track and follow those paths. So it's a beauty to have these things working all at the same time. Now, it turns out to be very interesting because uh, I had been doing some of this work with Isaac Kaminar and Naira Ovakimian, who is now in Illinois. And uh, I was pleased to publish this book with them. But many of the ideas that we used were circulated in the book. So this is something that pleased me enormously. Now, to give you an idea of the type of stuff that goes on. So um, you see, you have the top two vehicles. They know where they are, in fact, the three. So they can broadcast their position to the underwater vehicles. And then the underwater vehicles, by measuring ranges to the top ones, can find a relative position. So in the end, the underwater vehicles can find them out where they are. And then we engage a control system to make them go into formation. So it's like an orchestra because you have communication that are acoustics, acoustic communications, acoustic communications, and radio communications. And essentially here, thanks to Evologix, we actually used um, <coughs> modems equipped with atomic clocks. I think the drift rate was about 200 nanoseconds in 24 hours. So it was, it was excellent. So to make this work, and again, for the younger students, when you have the vehicle fleet, then you have what we call the cooperative maneuvers, but following trajectory tracking, and then they exchange data over a communication network using even driven communications. And then on each of the vehicles, you have what I would call the single vehicle primitives that are in charge of speed, heading, depth, so on and so forth. And then you have to show that all this works very well. So the final field tests were carried out in CNIS. And here you see a little bit of the complexity of the operation. By the way, the project was coordinated by my, my very good friend, Giovanni Diveri. From, uh, from Italy that you, that, that, that you know too well. And then there's a video and I'm not going to show it completely. Uh, oh, I don't know if this. I can't see the mouse. I think I have to get another set of glasses. Cines, the birthplace of Vasco da Gama, nowadays one of the main port areas. It's interesting, the tests were done in Cines, the birthplace of Where Vasco da Gama. No, sorry, sorry, in the video when you play, if you could advance to yeah, yeah, yeah. minute 133. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, that, that, that's fine, that's okay. fine. Thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now you have to play. No. Uh, okay. Let, let uh, okay, so again. Yeah, right there. Then, but then you have to play. Was reached. Okay. So the survey the final lasted test. over two hours. It was automatic. And it consisted of a mission with and seven autonomous vehicles, two autonomous catamarans carrying the Sparker seismic sources, one Medusa robot on the surface, aiding the underwater navigation as anchor node, and four AUVs, two Folaga and two Medusa robots, towing streamers at a depth between two to eight meters below the sea surface. The survey consisted 
of performing roughly seven laps of a racetrack path, scanning an area of approximately 100 meters by 200 meters. The acquisition was very successful, for it proved that the design... What about the data? The data is very interesting. Okay. I have the same problem. It's better here. Okay. Now, what I'm going to show you never ceases to mesmerize me. So we have a company from Portugal in the group that are specialists in acquiring the group and then processing in a way that can be interpreted by experts in a very nice manner. So what I'm going to show you is the stuff that they prepared based on the data. They actually do slices underneath the seabed. So you are actually penetrating. Oh, it's gone already. I, I can see. So you are starting to see the layers of penetration. This is, these are beautiful instruments to try and find out what is underneath the seabed. So you are going down, I think we went down to about 200 meters and you see all the details, the geophysical details of the thing. And I find this fabulous. Now, what they told us is that this too um, would be very interesting uh, when you are trying to build something near the coast and the big boats cannot go there with a full set of streamers and stuff like that. Um, but the guys from the industry told us, well, look, yeah, that looks very complex and then you need a bunch of engineers to operate this. So why not have all in one? So, okay, there is, um, all in one. So what? This jumps so quickly. So what I'm going to show you um, is the first commercial survey that we need with a system of this kind in France near a nuclear power plant because they, they wanted to see uh, what was underneath the seafloor in terms of establishing new foundations and stuff like that. So what you see here is our vehicle transformed with the arms. And then you don't see the streamers are there. You don't see them. And of course, we had the generators and all that. Uh, it, it, uh, don't it works like a charm because if you design the path following algorithms to counter out currents and stuff like that, you leave the vehicle on its own. It does the job for you. And then at the end of the day, you collect all the data. It's, it's, I think it's beautiful to see uh, this stuff. Okay, now, I may have to skip some slides because I don't have to, time to go through everything. Now, one of the most recent projects we have been involved in as to with the development of underwater vehicles hybrid that can operate both as ROVs and uh, IOVs to inspect critical infrastructures. And this is a specific one that goes as a, 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 an AUV, then it, it latches or attaches itself to an infra, underwater infrastructure, deploys a cable, goes around as an inspection, and then it leaves the stuff there and then comes back up as an AUV. So I'm not going to focus very much on this project, so I'll just jump through this very quickly. But what I wanted to show you is something that turned out to be very interesting to us. So for us... This is a video that I'm trying to play. I don't see the mouse. Uh, they, okay. Yeah, now, um, this vehicle was also designed to download data from underwater benthic stations. Or from so, it should be able to collect data from them. Here is the process of doing this using an optical link. So this forced us to develop an optical model. Which we did. 
talks about this and turns out that the modern that started with the largest effect, 15 kilobit per second, has now reached about 1 megabit per second. But my God, it costs about 400 euros to manufacture that complex. I'm not going to go through all the process of showing the communication link, but this is very interesting because it opens up an avenue. And I know that many people here, or some people here at Cal, have been doing outstanding stuff on open communications, which is which are extremely um, So what I'm going to show you now. another video yeah there you go okay so then we started think look when you are underwater and you are trying to do cooperative maneuvers it's very hard for the vehicles to communicate with each other underwater because you have acoustic modems uh, and there's the time division duplex and that so all the communications in the project that I showed you before were being routed through the surface. Now here we need to try something which is our they should be able to coordinate in other words with the certain information that really that using and this is what we did with our modems. So are compensated, but this is the first time the operation was done using optical modems. Now, I cannot brag too much because the system is Now, we have not solved all the problems in the world because these modems are highly directional. How do two ships find themselves in the middle of the ocean? So, but again, using uh, even driven communications and some form of prediction will help a lot with this. And then we have developed a model that we call Omnidirectional. So I wanted to, to leave this idea with you. It's very important for the future to have what we call multi-model communications, uh, optical and acoustic, so on and so forth. All right, this is a most recent project called Ramones that has to do with the radioactivity uh, underwater and the mapping of, of uh, radioactive sources or radioactivity. Uh, this is being co coordinated by our friends in Greece. And the idea is the following. Not much is known about radioactivity underwater, both man-made and natural. How do you map this? Uh, so it's 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 very hard for a number of reasons. This is what we plan to use under this. This is an FET project, which is sort I think sort of prestigious in Europe. So the idea is to have two underwater gliders equipped with all proper instrumentation and have a surface vehicle at the top. And again, they should coordinate. They should cooperate towards uh, finding a map of radioactivity. So. In this sense, it's very, it's quite akin to what we call ocean adaptive sampling. The vehicles must negotiate on the fly the best strategy to go based on prior data and based on whatever they measure. Now, again, I use the same expression. This is easier said than done. And the main reason, and at some point I, I felt like committing suicide. I mean, what are we going to do? Because when I started looking and learning a little bit about radioactivity, if you have a source at the bottom of the ocean, the alpha particles die ab about one meter away. Uh, beta, a little bit further. Gamma, maybe five meters. So what the heck are we doing? I mean, we are looking for uh, a needle in a haystack or stack, haystack, okay, in a haystack. Fortunately, most of the things that we are looking for in the final mission will take place at the island of Satorini uh, in Greece. They emit radon, which is a gas that diffuses upwards. And radon itself emits gamma radiation. So there's some hope. This is a wonderful uh, field for everyone to work on. 
uh, in what concerns adaptive ocean sampling. How do you maximize the quality of that map without going completely bananas and going left, right, up and down? How do you do this? We are working on this. So, of course, the key technological changes, cooperative planning, navigation, and control, again, they have to be there. We have two gliders, a wave glider, and the Bentic laboratory. Again, the same. Uh, and now it's essentially, now you have the sensor data kicking in, and the vehicles will have to digest this and exchange data and decide on the best strategy to follow. Um, this is the EU Ramones project. And now it's very, I feel almost ashamed of showing this slide after that beautiful presentation because each one of these babies, I think, costs about $180,000. It's, it's, it's immoral almost. So, okay, but we had to do the job. Now, what, 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 what is interesting is that um, we have done nothing of this. I mean, we have purchased the gliders. We are adapting them. Why? Because we want to work in shallow water. And as you know, someone mentioned before, uh, the gliders do not work well in shallow water. So fortunately, our friend at the Utsol, Dana Jorger, convinced the company to give us a version of the Slocum glider with a small thruster at the back. And the other thing, which is very worrisome with gliders, is that basically you program them to perform a certain mission, and you hope and pray they will come back. We do not want this because we want for the gliders to talk with the surface vehicle. And therefore, we managed to talk them into giving us access to what we call the backseat driver. And now we shall be able to talk among all, all, all of these vehicles. So um, I have too many. Uh, there are still two things that I would like to show to you. This one, I'm going to do it very quickly because it's slightly different from what we have been talking about. Um, I'm truly excited about this thing called ocean literacy. In other words, how do we convey to the population at large the message that what we are doing is important? And more than that, how do they break the barrier of the ocean and get a very good intuitive feeling as to what the ocean looks like and what these surveys uh, look like? So this was a European project that uh, finished rec recently. Yeah, it was coordinated by my very good friend Gianmarco, I don't know, Gianluca, no, I'm confused now, Massimo Caccia, Massimo Caccia in Genova. And the idea is relatively simple. So you have the vehicle in, and I was imagining doing this here near in the Red Sea. So you have a vehicle, you have an underwater uh, uh, ROV. Now you collect images and you transmit them to shore to an auditorium and people can have these smart apps that were developed in the course of the process whereby they can look at the images. But more than that, people can actually pilot the ROV, not of course sending direct commands to the thrusters, but sending high level commands, stay put, go to a certain depth, go right and go left. Uh, so, for me, it was very interesting because people seem to be very, very interested in this. And I think it's we owe this to the society to show society at large that whatever we are doing may be interesting. And of course, we are not the precursors. Many people had thought about this before, especially in the, in the United States. So what did we do? I'm not going to get into the details. Just wanted to show that some of the images that we could collect um, there's a small video of it. Or maybe not, maybe not. Let me let me go to the next one. Yeah, the feature, that's the canon. Now, uh, do you have difficulties too? So the, this is not the best video. I couldn't find a better one because it's sped up. But essentially, this vehicle is being commanded from Genova in Italy, and we are operating it uh, off the coast of Portugal in the south. So you can actually see the cannon here of the vehicle and uh, commanding the motion of the vehicle. So there's another one that I like that is the steering wheel. Here I got it. There's the steering wheel. So actually, 
goes inside the ship and you can see the steering wheel. And it's very interesting, especially for the kids to see all of this. And they get another notion of the, of the ocean. And also because they can actually command the vehicle to do whatever they wish it to do. Now, this is my friend, Marco Biboli uh, in Italy, actually commanding. No, it's maybe on the other one. Yeah, it's here. So He's sitting in Italy and he's commanding the vehicle and actually looking at the images and giving these commands. Now, of course, this is not new. We are just trying to spread the word that these actions are extremely important for the population at large, for students, and to approach, you know, to make the, the ocean less mysterious about things. There's a video, some of those of you that may wish to consult, and then I'll wrap up with something that will be better explained by Nguyen Hung that came with me and he has a poster about this. So now let's talk about the purely theoretical and technological problem. When it comes to navigation underwater, I do believe that, of course, we cannot use inertial systems. I mean, they are outrageous and, and, and we cannot put beacons all over the place. I mean, well, maybe in some places you can. I'm a fan of using uh, cooperation between surface vehicles and then underwater vehicles, whereby the surface vehicles, just by measuring ranges, find out where the underwater vehicles are and give them this information. This is cheap. And this is essentially what we have been using. So Hung will explain this better in the poster. So given M targets underwater and trackers with range measuring devices, what's the best strategy for the motion of the trackers? to localize the targets while remaining in a desired vicinity of the targets. And the beautiful about this, and this Hung did for his PhD thesis, is that it brings together uh, the tools of estimation theory using the posterior kramer or bound, MPC strategies, cooperative distributed estimation and control. So it's very interesting because using these tools in MPC, what you do is the following. We start with some knowledge about the motion of the underwater targets, initial distribution, state noise. I'm being a bit more specific now, sense of noise. And now you engage an optimization process whereby based on the prediction of the Fisher information matrix, you decide on the best move to maximize that information. And then you apply just the first step. And then you engage a filter on the side that will give you an idea of the kind of uh, covariance that you are getting. And that's what th the prior information again. So this thing unfolds as, as you go. And I'll finish with this. I'm just showing for the case of one vehicle trying to find out where the target is. Thank you. So this was in a paper with Tori Olamson at MP and yeah, it's here. This is just one. The beautiful thing, yeah. Okay, so when I imported, okay, no problem. But I, I have the, I'll show you very quickly. And then I'll conclude. Oh. oh, this is a real thing. I mean, where you have two vehicles on top and another vehicle at the bottom, and they were actually doing this kind of circular motion and stuff to try and find out where the other one is and flying along. So believe me, it works in practice, which is very, very interesting. So just a few things, two or three things. Uh, we are running together with our friends in Toulon, this Mir Erasmus Mundus, I don't know, I have 66 there, uh, which has been very successful. So I would like to call your attention to this. And we have students from all over the world. And at some point, it would be lovely to extend and, and maybe include Kaust or anyone else. It would be great. And the other thing is, uh, we recently started a project with India, and this is on coral reef monitoring exactly, 
but I wanted to bring your attention to the fact that under a European project called Ecobotics, we are going to organize the Marine, International Marine Robotics School in Goa in India in November. And I'll let you know about this. We would love to invite at least some of you to come and give some of the lectures or participate online. I think it's great because we are trying to extend this to the Pacific Rim. So now regarding the questions you had posed, now from a pure technology standpoint, I think we have done some process collectively towards the development of autonomous systems for marine habitat mapping, that's clear. Environmental mapping and, and ocean sampling, geotechnical surveys, inspection of infrastructure, underwater infrastructures, ocean literacy, and something I have not mentioned, but it's again a beautiful problem. When you have these sets of surface and underwater vehicles, you can actually use them to try and track big mammals and pelagic fish. In the Azores, we are trying to do this to follow uh, what, what manta rays are doing and to understand their social behavior. Now, what needs to be done uh, in order to improve our capabilities, multimodal communications, it's going to be extremely important. Long range, animal, geophysical inspired navigation. I didn't show you, but we have been working on geophysical navigation using both terrain maps and the magnetic field. Energy harvesting, but I don't know how to do that under the ice and karstic operations. Karstic is going inside caves underwater. It's a beautiful field. We just submitted one project and it was not approved. So I'm very disappointed anyway. And then sensor-based operation in unstructured environments. I'm sorry it went a little bit out of control in terms of timing, uh, but I leave my coordinates here in case you wish to ask me some questions later. Thank you very much.